Okay, wonderful. Um, well, today we have the pleasure of having uh, Ken Van Tilburg. Ken is a uh, professor at NYU and uh, also a sort of research scientist at the CCA. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I like a defining aspect of his career, I think, has been looking for kind of the, the traces, maybe, of uh, all of the physics that's sort of hiding potentially beyond the standard model uh, in, in the sort of astrophysical. Uh, universe as we see it. So, um, Ken, thanks so much for, for joining us and take it away. Thank you uh, for that introduction. I think that's uh, exactly right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trained as a particle physicist, but uh, I try to use uh, unusual systems, usually uh, involving uh, precision instruments or, or just precision observables to, to look for New, new types of physics beyond the standard model. So both in the laboratory and uh, in astrophysical and cosmological settings. So uh, today I will tell you about an idea um, to look for weakly coupled particles uh, around stars. Can you so, pause for a second? Because we're having yeah. a little bit of sound trouble on our end. Um, it's the okay. internet. Um, I'll try to connect to the other. I see. It's possible it's the NYU network. No, I think it's our network. Yeah, like I've had this issue in some other calls as well, unfortunately. Okay, uh, I that should be. So, if you'd like to go ahead now, I'm sorry about that. I see. Yeah, I think it, um, the, the Zoom folks are saying it's fine. It on, seems like it's there. No. I Happy to wait for a little bit. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no worries. So, right. So this is the, the, the thing I will talk about today is an idea I had uh, in June of 2020. So mid pandemic uh, hallucination that, that now is shaping a, at least part of my research program. And the idea is to look for new uh, weakly coupled particles beyond the standard model uh, around stars. So just as a you know, one, one slide summary here on the right, I'm showing a, a little animation of a, of a simulation and there are simulations that are still ongoing of uh, the solar system. So you see the star in the middle is the sun um, and then Venus, Earth, Mars, and on the outskirts here is, is Jupiter. So it's a top-down view of the, of the solar system in units of AU. Uh, and the, the colored orbits are particles that were initially emitted by the sun uh, onto bound orbits. And um, the, the key idea is that these orbits can ac accumulate over time. So as, as the sun is emitting these particles, some of them, or most of them, in fact, will fly out to infinity Typically, they're emitted uh, on relativistic orbits that are unbound, um, but some are emitted uh, in on, onto bound orbits, and they will accumulate over time, potentially over the age of, of the sun or the star in question, and that can lead to um, new prospects for, for detection. So as you can see, some, some of these orbits are crossing Earth, so we can try to look, look for these particles with experiments on Earth. Um, we can look for other signatures like their decays. Um, yeah, and uh, an anomalous cooling signatures as well. So, so that's, that's the, the basic idea. And it's, uh, so the first two papers um, uh, I listed here. Um, the second one with uh, Robert Lazenby, who's a postdoc at, at Stanford. Um, can and, I stop uh, you again? Do a yeah. One minute switch of the speaker to a different computer. Um, okay. Because it's fine on some people's computers, but it's patchy on the one we're on here. 
that, so you're going to have to come. Okay. Can you hear us now? Yep. yep. And uh, how's the audio in the room now? Wait, it seems good. So uh, go ahead. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, no worries. It's a fact of life now. So yeah, the, the, the papers I've listed here, so some of them are with uh, Robert Lazenby, including ongoing work with uh, Cara Giovanetti um, about simulations, uh, preliminary one of which I'm, I'm showing here of this uh, solar basin. Um, and then we're also looking uh, for, for these particles indirectly by, by their decays near the sun uh, with X-ray observatories. This is with Will DeRocco, who's now at Santa Cruz. Shalma Wexman is a student at NYU. And Brian Greffenstetter, uh, who is a, a new star, so an X-ray uh, experimentalist and observer, and Jin Wu Huang at, at Perimeter Institute. Um, yeah, and so, so this... Uh, Population of bound particles that I call a stellar basin or, or a solar basin around our sun. So, okay, so just to, since this is maybe not uh, that familiar to the, to the audience, uh, just a, a quick recap of, of stellar emission. So uh, the sun and any, most stars in fact, are kind of poor photon emitters, which is why they, they live so long. Uh, for, for two reasons. So the first reason is that the, the, the surface is quite cool. So for the sun, it's 6,000 Kelvin, whereas the, the, the core is uh, much hotter, right? But the, but the photons from the core don't uh, uh, escape, at least not initially, that they get reabsorbed uh, in the core and, and, and give radiation pressure. Uh, the, uh, yeah. And so the, the, the second reason is that, it, it, well, is, is the one I mentioned is that the mean free path is, uh, is very short, so there's only effective emission from uh, a small layer uh, at, at the surface, which is furthermore cool. And that actually leads to some uh, interesting facts. So for example, that neutrino cooling uh, it may, may not be negligible for some stars. It is negligible for, for the sun, uh, but it is not so for other stars, like for example, neutron stars, so a hot neutron star or a young neutron star in the first 100,000 years of its life cools primarily through neutrino emission, not through surface emission from, from photons. And this is despite the fact that the effective coupling of neutrinos is, is something like 20, 20 or more orders of magnitude uh, smaller than that of a photon. Okay, um, and so this, uh, also applies to hypothetical new particles. Here I'm calling it an axion, um, but uh, it could be really any type of weakly coupled particle that can escape, just like a neutrino. So this was realized in the late 70s that, that uh, just by not observing anomalous cooling of stars and that our stellar codes work pretty well, that uh, you can constrain the couplings of, of new particles like axions. And so most of it has focused on, on relativistic emission of these particles. Um, and uh, so some experiments have been devised to, to also look for them on Earth, right? So if, if, if these particles are emitted by the sun, we can try to look for them uh, in, with detectors on Earth for these unbound particles. Um, the same detectors typically can also look for these particles uh, if they're dark matter. As I said, they're, uh, I'm assuming that these particles are going to be weakly coupled, so they could potentially play the role of dark matter as well. Um, and so, yeah, often the same detectors can look for both the solar emitted particles as well as the uh, dark, dark matter population if, if, they, if it exists. Um, what I pointed out was that there is something uh, peculiar uh, ab about most of these particles uh, emission. 
So we, we don't normally don't think about it, but, but photons are massless, right? So they, they necessarily escape to infinity. They don't have bound orbits, but these new particles ha have a mass. So, so a small fraction of them can be emitted onto bound orbits um, and accumulate over time. And it's a small fraction, but the long accumulation time means that there's significant consequences for, for late time. So it looks like it's a non-relativistic particle around the sun. Um, so it kind of looks like dark matter, except it's not cosmologically produced, it's, it's uh, solar produced. So yeah, uh, this is uh, the, all of the particle physics you need to know. Uh, basically, if, if you have a light bosonic particle, um, there's only a finite number of possibilities uh, depending on its quantum number. So if it's a scalar particle, so it's a parity even spin zero particle, a pseudo scalar if it's a parity odd spin zero particle, or it could be a spin one particle, a vector. Uh, there's really only 10 couplings. So if it's, if, if it's a scalar, it can couple to electrons, quarks, photons, and gluons. And so these are the four leading interactions you can, you can possibly have, classify all of them. Same with the pseudo scalar. Uh, again, electrons, quarks, photons, and gluons. And a vector only has two possibilities. One thing that we call a kinetically mixed photon, so it sort of uh, has some uh, mixed propagation with a regular photon with parameterized by some small coupling epsilon, or it can couple to um, it can couple like a regular photon, where except the charges are not electric charge but baryon number minus lepton number. So, so for the beginning of the talk, I'm going to focus on just this pseudo scalar coupling to electrons. So what can happen is just Brehm strong off, off an electron. So uh, let's say time goes from left to right. So an electron scatters off an ion in the sun. Uh, and in that uh, electron ion scattering process, uh, there's some Brehm strong radiation, except it's not, a, it's not a photon this time, but it, it's an axion. And likewise, comp, an analog of the Compton scattering process where you produce this axion particle through this coupling. Uh, if, if, for example, you have a photon coupling, uh, you know, you can have uh, photons scattering off of ions and producing this axion, and that can also lead to uh, the case of these axions. If you just have the electron coupling, the k's are typically pretty slow because they have to go through a, a loop. It's not so important. And in sort of this, the second part of the talk, I'm going to discuss this vector particle uh, analog. Okay, so, but this is this, uh, first for the axion particle. So you don't really need to know all of the particle physics, but I'm just going to show you here the, the effective coupling uh, as a function of mass of this particle. So this parameter by this GAEE coupling. And uh, basically if the coupling is, um, if the dimensionless coupling is, is larger than three times 10 to minus 13 or so, and if the particle is sufficiently light, so below the um, the temperature of the star, like a which is 10, 10 kV for a red giant and one kV for a typical white dwarf, then you would anomalously cool. So anywhere in this gray region, you would anomalously cool red giant stars um, and shorten their lifetime, increase the 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 mass of the core at the at the end of its life. Um, and uh, on the right here, I'm showing the spectrum of emitted uh, axion particles for the two different uh, couplings. So, so the orange curve would be what, what, what the spectrum looks like um, if this um, particle can be, can be emitted by the sun. With this coupling 10 to the minus 13, that's uh, still allowed. Uh, so it's below this this gray curve, and um, yeah. So so just as a point, it, it's emitted from the core of the sun, and that's why the typical energy is of order one kV, which corresponds to the thermal energy at the, at fifty million Kelvin, the core the solar um, core temperature. So this this spectrum would be the spectrum of a, a massless axion, and here I'm I'm showing a cartoon. So here I'm also uh, showing this differential energy loss rate per unit volume, per unit energy. So you can think of it as a spectrum um, now on a log scale. And so at, at low 
energies. So if, if, if you're looking at the massless case, at low energies, you're phase space suppressed. So it typically scales like some polynomial as a function of frequency. Um, and then once as a function of energy, and, and for energies far above the temperature, eventually you get the Boltzmann suppression because uh, there's not enough energy in the core to, to produce very high energy modes. Um, but now if, if these particles have a mass, let's say not too far removed from the temperature of the star, then the spectrum gets modified and uh, it, it looks like the black curve over here. And then the, the new possibility that opens up is that in this blue sliver, you have just enough energy to produce the particle, but not enough to escape the potential of the solar system. So, um, and, and those, would, those particles would be emitted onto a bound orbit. And in fact, it's, you can estimate uh, by dimensional analysis, uh, the fraction of the blue sliver compared to everything else. And it's basically because you're sort of, you, you can emit into all parts of phase space and the, the total integral under the curve here typically gives you something like, that scales like temperature to the fourth power. Whereas if you're only integrating over the blue sliver, you get something like uh, the ball in phase space where you can emit, which goes like the escape velocity uh, cubed times the mass of the force. So the ratio is typically uh, of order, the, the fractional ratio. So sorry, that's, that's a redundant. The, the, the ratio of bound to unbound orbits, uh, if the mass is close to the temperature, goes like V escape cubed, so the escape velocity cubed. Uh, in units of the speed of light, where the speed of light is one. So for the sun, at, in the core of the sun, the escape velocity is a little bit higher than 10 to the minus three. So one part in a billion of these axions would be emitted into a bound orbit, which sounds small, but uh, let me give you a counter argument for, for why it's not small. Okay, so um, I, I gave you the heuristic argument, but the the actual formula that I derived in, in, in my paper from June 2020 is this one. So if you ask what is the energy density injection rate into bound orbits as observed from a radius r outside of the star, um, it's some volume integral of, of some function, this q tilde, which is not so important. The, the most important thing is that it falls off as one over r to the fourth, um, whereas the Unbound emission, so the stuff that gets emitted uh, to infinity, right, just by Gauss's law, goes like one over r squared. So this integral here would be the luminosity, and then the energy density would, would be just be that diluted by one over four pi r squared by Gauss's law. So this is an energy density injection rate, and this is just an instantaneous density from unbound orbits. So if you ask what's what's the ratio after of these two after some accumulation time tau, if these bound orbits accumulate for some time tau, some time tau, um, you find um, you find this. So uh, yeah, if you compute these integrals again, it's not so important what they are. Uh, the the end result is that it's a product. This ratio is a product of a, a very big number and a very small number. So as, as promised before you get something of order V escape cubed. It turns out it's like V escape squared at the radius R times V escape in the core of the star, which is which was this thing I derived heuristically. And this is small, um, let's say at Earth's location. Um, but uh, this factor is enormous, right? So tau could potentially be as long as the age of the sun. So 4.6 billion years and R for, our location is eight light minutes, right? So this small factor is counteracted by four billion uh, years over eight minutes. Um, and indeed, so if, if let's parameterize it as a function of tau. So if tau is a million years, then these ratio, this tiny sliver as it accumulates uh, eventually gives you something. Uh, yeah, so the, the bound emission starts dominating after a million years. So what this accumulation time is, is was not known um, when I wrote my first paper. And uh, so I made some crude estimates. I had some conservative estimate based on just the chaotic time scale 
of orbits in the solar system that is 10 million years. If you look at some asteroid data uh, and, and some forward propagation of what they do, um, you get a fiducial time of 10 to the eight years. The asteroid orbits are sort of a, a, are biased and it's not, not representative of the orbits that, that are emitted from the sun. Um, and so if you, if you do some other estimates based on just rates of close encounters and secular perturbation theory, the typical time you get is, uh, is basically the age of the solar system. So um, yeah, this is, these are all the technicalities for, for the doc. The rest will be sort of pictures and, and we can discuss. So the, the point is particles are emitted into bound orbits. They accumulate and uh, they can be uh, important that after a long accumulation time for, for detection. And um, from here on out, I'm going to discuss how this basin evolves. So I'm gonna to try to figure out what this accumulation time is for the sun. And uh, I'll show you uh, preliminary results on analyses based on, on this population of particles. So I, I, I'm happy to take a question now if, if you have any natural stopping point. I, I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, about this tau. Can you tell us a bit more about? Oh, sorry, it's a little. Okay. You get a, it then turn off the speaker. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I need to. Okay. Uh, so, can you tell me more about this tau? What is the constraint we're going to talk um, I'm having a really hard time hearing you here. Okay. Um, I'm asking why do I care about the Lyapunov time? That is the relevance. Why it is the Lyapunov time? You're asking why why that why I put it there? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, that that was sort of a conservative estimate. So uh, it it's a huge underestimate. So so. In fact, uh, well, spoiler alert, I think the effective tau for orbits uh, crossing Earth's orbit is uh, is uh, 1.2 billion years. So it's somewhere in between this asteroid estimate and this optimistic estimate based on secular perturbation theory. Uh, I just basically in a Lyapun of time, the, the phase space gets scrambled uh, at least partially. And uh, so, so, that, so that time scale, it was just a conservative lower bound on how short this accumulation time was. But, but already then, you know, even with this super conservative estimate, it, it was already interesting, like the bound, uh, the bound fraction would be uh, larger than the, the, the bound density would be larger than the unbound density locally. Gotcha, gotcha. So, so do you care about the up enough because the orbits get scrambled, but they, they don't, they, the particles don't get ejected. So they do, they do. And that's, that's what I'll talk about. No, yeah. Thanks. Um, so it was, it was actually not known. Uh, just a simple question: What's the gravitational lifetime? So by gravitational, I mean the the lifetime against um, motional resonances and and kicks and uh, uh, kicks from close encounters of just a non-interacting particle in the solar system. So stability of the solar system was studied. Uh, you know, by, by Delaunay, Poisson, Gauss, the, the cl classical uh, mechanics uh, giants from back in the day. Um, but they mostly focused on two uh, orbits, circular orbits in, in a plane, right? Interactions of the planets, obviously, uh, not for sort of generic parts of phase space. Um, and so, yeah, some simulations had been done on dark matter capture in the solar system and dark matter capture is the time reverse problem of ejection, right? So um, gravity is time reversal invariant. So if you get the capture rate, you can also get the ejection rate. But again, uh, it was not exactly the precise question that we wanted to ask. Um, so uh, that's why we're doing in-body simulations with Robert Lazenby and Cara Giovanetti. We're finding some uh, pretty cool results. I'll, I'll show you some of them here. 
Uh, and so this is important not just to get the final value of tau, but also to see uh, what the annual modulation is of the density locally. So Earth is moving in an eccentric orbit. So as it gets closer, you might think you have more density versus when it's at aphelion where you get less density. There might even be some sort of astrology uh, correlation where the location of the planets may matter. Uh, in particular, Jupiter's location may matter um, uh, yeah, for, for, for the density because uh, as it can shape this sort of this, this basin density, its orbits is uh, asymmetric, uh, eccentric. So uh, I'm going to sh show you an animation now. So this is a uh, very fast on human time scales. So I'm, I'm not showing the particle orbiting now. Now I'm just going, uh, I'm showing you the evolution uh, of the Keplerian orbit as a function of time. So on the top is a side view, on the right is a side view. This is a top view of the solar system. So if I can just go back from the beginning, this is, it's emitted on a, from the sun, right? So these particles are emitted onto uh, very radial orbits. Um, and I'm just showing 10 here. And uh, because the, the solar system, so if, if there's no planets, the solar system, these orbits would just stay fixed and, and, and remain on Keplerian orbits. But the leading order, the solar system breaks angular momentum uh, conservation in the, uh, in the X and Y directions. So you'll see that in these uh, side views, the, the orbits become circular, at least the projection onto these side views becomes circular pretty quickly. So that's the scrambling time in about a million years or 10 million years. Whereas uh, from the top view, the angular momentum in the Z direction does not get scrambled as quickly. So here, yeah, so the, the angular momentum in the Z direction stays more or less constant, uh, but it gets pretty scrambled pretty quickly. And there's some interesting behavior like light of uh, cosi oscillations, et cetera. Um, in the orbits here. So, right. Uh, and, but you see at least, you know, over these 5 million years of this little animation that, that none of the particles uh, get ejected. So their semi-major axis or their binding energy stays approximately fixed. Um, so we've simulated thousands of particles. So this is now the semi-major axis as a function of time from the birth of the solar system to 100 million years. Um, let me just clean it up a little bit and show you fewer of them. So most of the particles are emitted uh, close to the sun just from phase space reasons. And the ones um, that don't cross Venus and Earth at, uh, are extremely stable, right? So the semi-major axis is basically constant as a function of time. These orbits don't cross Earth, um, but as you go, Further and further out, you can have close encounters with Venus and Earth. And if you're very far out, so if basically if the orbit is, if your semi major axis is above 2.6 AU, uh, Jupiter can slingshot you out and typically does so within uh, 10 million years. So this particle gets ejected quickly. Any particle, so here, like a lot of these particles, once they, once they reach 2.5, 2.6 AU, they just get kicked out. So all the vertical lines going up here. Our, our ejections. That happens pretty fast. So these are all of the ejected particles uh, in, in a preliminary run that, that we did. Um, so none of the none of the uh, particles close to Earth were, were ejected. Um, only the, the far away ones. Um, and uh, yeah, Robert Lazenby, my collaborator, came came up with some. Uh, cool tricks. So the, the first sort of uh, dumb brute force way to simulate what happens is to uh, continuously eject particles over the age of the sun, integrate forward and check how much how much, many crossings there are with Earth to, to get a discrete estimator for the density. Um, and there we put a lower bound of 1.1 billion years. Uh, it's still somewhat biased because not all of the simulations have finished uh, running. Um, that's why it's a lower bound and not an estimate. And here I'm showing the velocity phase space. So uh, in, in sun coordinates, so Earth is in, on a circular orbit with some azimuthal velocity normalized to one. And so this um, semicircle, anything in the semicircle 
would be a bound orbit. Um, and you see most of the orbits are quite eccentric, so they're not on circular orbits. Uh, they're mostly they're mostly radial-ish, and 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 uh, yeah, they get scrambled in this way. And, and not all of phase space is occupied, so so very retrograde circular orbits are, have not yet been populated, or typically do not get populated. Um, but Robert's trick was was actually also, uh, was was to integrate backwards. So he did the time reverse problem instead of emitting from the sun and then checking how many times you cross Earth. He did the opposite thing. He uh, emitted from Earth these particles backwards in time and checked how many times the particles cross the sun, which happens much more often uh, and is a more efficient way of estimating the density. Um, and you can estimate tau. It's going to be in our paper with, with this uh, formula. And, and we get a much more precise estimate of 1.4 billion years. So these are two independent checks. Um, Uh, yeah, of this lifetime, we um, and in fact, uh, sorry, this is a, an old. Uh, we've corrected for some biases, and, and two billion years is our is our is going to be final number, I believe. Yeah, with similar uh, results for how the phase space density gets scrambled, although with fewer statistics, because we have just remitting from from Earth, so there's a uh, yeah fewer statistics for this. Um, and we've checked that it doesn't depend on the algorithm used. So we use a IS15, which is some 15th order uh, integrator as well as some 12th order algorithm. Uh, and so, yeah, so the forward and backwards runs, uh, runs agree as well. Um, this is just showing you the, the different simulations. So all of the forward simulations, which have some survival bias, um, we had 256 backward simulations that all finished. So we run, run them backwards in time uh, to 4.6 billion years in the past or until the particle is ejected uh, going back in time. So that these, these first 256 particles, test particles we injected, uh, all, of, all of those simulations have finished in that sense. So that's an unbiased sample and that was the, you know, that was the number I, I quoted here, 1.4 billion years is the, is the peak of this distribution. But we've started thousands. And if you take the first 2048, most of which have finished, um, but not all, we get a slightly lower estimate. So, so this is um, biased low. So, so you can take this estimate of, of 1.2 as a conservative estimate. But the real answer is likely uh, in between here. And the spread is just a bootstrapped way of getting our uncertainty. So we don't know it perfectly, even just from, from our limited statistics. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna skip this. So this is what you get in the end for the final density. So uh, we, we've computed this um, these plots for exactly from our simulations. So, so no, uh, no heuristics. So what I'm showing you here is the final density at Earth's location as a function of particle, of, as a function of this axion mass for different couplings. And you get some interesting dynamics. So as you increase the coupling, you get more and more and more. Um, if the coupling is as large as 10 to the minus 11, you get as much density. Oh, I forgot the units, I'm sorry. Uh, this, these are units of GV per centimeter cubed. So the, the for reference, the gray line is the local dark matter density. So you can exceed the local dark matter density if the coupling is very big. Um, there's some curious curious physics. So as, as you increase the coupling, eventually you, you saturate to a detailed balance. So it's basically where this basin of particles uh, has an equal emission rate uh, and absorption rate in the sun. So you achieve a detailed balance. So the, your occupation number, this is the Phase space occupation number gets that of a Bose Einstein occupation uh, number. So it equilibrates with the sun, basically. Um, so, yeah, so, so you have quite a high density around a star. Um, so, um, you can look for this with experiments on Earth, right? So, you, so you have this density of particles, you can, you can look for them uh, with dark matter experiments. 
uh, even though this particle, again, is not dark matter, it's produced by the sun, but it kind of looks and smells like dark matter. And indeed, dark matter detectors can look for it. So I'm not going to go into all of the details on, on, on dark matter detectors, but the basic idea is that a particle can be um, this axion particle, it couples to electrons. So it can ionize um, a xenon atom as it gets absorbed. Uh, and that ionization uh, event will cause some scintillation light, which is called S1. Um, but the ionized electrons can also drift upwards and produce some additional signal uh, called S2 from, from this drift. And you can use these two things to um, uh, discriminate against the background and get an energy estimate for what the mass of the particle or the energy of the particle was. Um, yeah, and get some localization information as well. So this is a picture from the xenon Montan experiment, uh, which published their results in June 2020. So I, so I scrambled to finish up my to, to finish up the, this this idea, because indeed they what they found was a, an excess of events at low energies with a typical energy uh, of order the uh, core temperature in the sun. I I don't I I think this excess is not quite real. It may be some radioactive it likely is some radioactive contamination but but anyway it's uh they, they could have plausibly uh, seen something as i'll show next um so um what they interpreted it as was a um let's look in this plot a solar axion so if you say that it's a relativistic solar axion so a massless axion uh you can get this as you can fit this excess with uh, with such a population. The problem was that in their parameter space, so if you, you can couple to electrons here, you can couple to photons, and you can couple to nuclei, and anywhere in the blue band, you, you fit well uh, this excess of events, um, except the problem was that the only allowed parameter space was this orange, uh, orange or orange sphere over there. Um, so it's just engrossed, like it could not possibly be real, at least not for this type of signal because uh, it was already excluded by other measurements. So, so other stellar cooling measurements. So this is the same plot, electron coupling and photon coupling. If you don't want to cool stars at all, you have to live in this uh, turquoise band. And to fit their signal, you needed to live in the, in the red band. So uh, engrossed violation of, of these cooling bounds. It's a log plot. So, um, yeah, these experiments can also look for for dark matter. So, if you assume these particles make up the dark matter, you can you can look for them. Uh, yeah, and so 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 th that would actually be a plausible explanation. So, this excess of events was sort of this the the fact that the black line was above the uh, the green and the yellow band. Uh, so they, their limit, their limit on the on the coupling was worse than expected. Um, okay, so so to summarize uh, this this part, so there's this um, excess could be due to three populations. So yeah, again, this is the same coupling plot of the electron coupling versus axion mass. I'll just break it down slowly over time. Um, if it were a relativistic axion, so a massless relativistic axion, which was their signal interpretation, they needed a coupling somewhere in this red band, uh, which was in violation of these prior cooling constraints. Um, so that would correspond to, um, yeah, so sort of a this relativistic emission. Um, if it is, um, if the particle makes up the dark matter, uh, you know, we know its density, and in fact. Uh, a dark matter, uh, dark matter particles, you know, with the right energy, with the right mass could explain the excess. But my claim was that um, this bound fraction is uh, quite, this bound density is quite high, not quite as large as the dark matter density, but for a similar coupling, uh, you could, you could uh, explain, explain this excess. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and so, and, and you could explain the excess even if uh, even if the particle was was not dark matter, and because the density of this um, 
the non-relativistic solar basin population is higher, uh, it, it's sensitive to smaller couplings. Um, and so now with these simulations, uh, this is a, a, our new updated result. So where we've uh, assumed if this fiducial um, accumulation time uh, from from our simulation. So so if you in, if you just if you're conservative and you take all the previous dark matter limits on this coupling, you can recast it into this into this uh, a, a new limit independent of cosmology, just from axions produced by by the sun, and uh, and get a a competitive limit. It doesn't quite exceed uh, the stellar cooling limits. However, this is insensitive to you know stellar evolution of, of uh, red giants and white dwarfs, which is somewhat complicated. And furthermore, these experiments are improving with time. In fact, now there's a xenon n ton running where n is six, so they have a six times more sensitive experiment with three times lower background. So in one year time, this uh, this excess will be confirmed or, or falsified, and, and also if they don't see anything, the, the limit will improve for this type of particle. Um, and so, so that's that's going to be the claim. So this solar basin or stellar basins in general will form the basis, I think, for for the leading probe of any weakly coupled particle with a mass of, of around a keV. So uh, in fact, what I've shown you here was the simplest example, but not the most spectacular example. Um, so I'm going to show you a completely analogous example for um, a, a vector particle now. Uh, it's not going to be too long. So that was the second paper we put out. So the this particle, so this is just a Maxwell Lagrangian just for R photon. Just imagine there's now a, a new photon, F prime, so a second dark photon uh, that mixes with with R photon with some tiny by some tiny amount epsilon, and this new photon has a mass as well. Um, so the production is very analogous, except it can occur resonantly. So there's due to some plasma effects uh, at low masses, you can have resonant production, and that makes the production much more dramatic by the sun. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll skip this, but so in the end, th these are analogous plots. So, so where the dark photon energy density in GeV per centimeter cube can exceed the dark matter density, even for couplings that are that that were still allowed, uh, and you can build up to this detailed balance thermal occupation number uh, in some cases, and in this case. Uh, I'll show you this limit. Uh, in this case, now this solar basin, if you sort of re, if you reinterpret existing dark matter experiments from the xenon collaboration um, in, in our work now, based on our simulations, we, we get this new blue limit. So uh, over quite a few orders of magnitude and in various places, we set the best limit on, on this new particle, this uh, simple uh, vector particle mixed with our photon. So in a small region here, in a small region there, in a big triangle here, where we improve the bounds by, by an order of magnitude already with existing data, and this, in a corner over there as well. And again, both of, all of these bounds will improve. So there's a, uh, an experiment running uh, or being developed now, being built now, super CDMS, that will be sensitive to very light dark matter, and uh, it will carve out a huge part of parameter space, even if this axion is not dark matter. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the bottom line on on, uh, on direct detection. I want to leave some time for questions, so I'm going to skip. Um, I'm going to give you just a brief summary of of the next part. So this is direct detection on Earth. Um, what what can also happen is just uh, indirect detection. So um, uh, so what what can happen is so this basin density goes like one over radius to the fourth power. So the the local density is appreciable, but not very large, like of order the dark matter or a little bit less or a little bit higher. Um, but 
near the surface of the sun, the density can be huge. Uh, not so large that it gravitationally perturbs the sun, but, but very large uh, nevertheless. And so uh, what can happen or what may be observable is if these particles decay to two photons. So you have a, a keV part, mass particle that, that is non-relativistic and decays to two photons. So you, you would get a line um, at half the rest at half the mass, at half the energy of the rest mass energy of the particle, um, uh, yeah, coming from near the surface of the sun um, with a known sort of spatial distribution with, that, that's limb brightened. Um, so what we've done is we've, we've used new star data to look at the limb of the sun. Uh, so basically like a, close to the surface of the sun uh, when the sun was very quiet and um, uh, our analysis should be out soon. So um, let me just show you the, the final sort of our, our energy or the, uh, our, our final results. So this is the raw data of all of the photons collected in the field of view. The red, the red is sort of the, the solar disk here. Um, and uh, we look for um, a, a, a signal primarily in the limb with some characteristic spectral and, and angular template. Uh, so our, actual, our signal, um, yeah, I don't have it, sorry. I, 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 forgot, the, I forgot the plot, but our, our signal is sort of limb light, brightened, so it, it would be dominated here. Um, and um, for this axion coupled to photons, we, we again, so a different coupling now, just coupled to photons, we, uh, we set a limit that improves on existing constraints by, by two orders of magnitude. Um, and, and this method uh, will work for any type of star. So you can look for uh, stellar basins around white dwarfs, neutron stars, um, hot supergiants like Betelgeuse, uh, where, where, which is much hotter and can look for other particles. So, so um, let me let me con let me conclude um, let me conclude there. So, yeah, I think uh, stars can we're known to be uh, uh, laboratories of new physics, and we can look for uh, direct detection um, of of these uh, new particles. So it's you know star the star is not only a laboratory that that uh, produces produces these particles, but we can actually look for these particles in, in, in our laboratories as well. Um, but uh, we can also look for them indirectly uh, from, from their uh, X-ray decays, for example. Um, and not just around the sun, but, but around other objects too, which is going to be work that uh, I'll be doing in the near future. So I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop here and thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take many questions. Thanks. So maybe let's start online. I, I um, may, uh, Martin Elvis, do you want to go ahead? Uh, I saw you had a question. And then oh, Dave. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, you can do direct detection close to the sun if you get into a Parker solar probe type orbit. And uh, mm -hmm. at Perry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yes, it's a, I, and I, I read it in the chat as well. Yeah, you get a couple of hundred thousand times the flux that you get on Earth. So even a fairly small experiment might be useful. There. Yeah, we 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 thought of that. Um, you can't quite get to uh, yeah the if you if you could get to the solar surface like really the, you know you would the like you say because it's one over r to the fourth you're two hundred times closer so you would get. Um, yeah, almost uh, 10 orders of magnitude or so, nine orders of magnitude in, in density. Um, it is a pretty extreme environment, though, uh, and, and the probe does get radioactive as it gets close to the sun uh, with a lot of char charged particles around. Right, but you uh, don't have to get that close to gain uh, five orders of magnitude, and Parker Solar Probe has already demonstrated it can be done. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we have thought about it. We haven't done any analysis. I, I'd be happy to uh, collaborate with anyone or I'd be happy if someone else did the analysis too. Yeah, and indeed, uh, an interesting thing that you could do, let's say if it's 10 times closer to the sun, um, you don't, what, what we're looking for is the, the uh, you know, the, the 
the, the, the X-ray telescope, New Star, is looking directly at the sun, and the photons pass through um, the optical table and get, get focused on, on the sensor. But what you could do with a probe like uh, Parks is just close the aperture completely, just have a box with insight shielded very well and have a, a sensor inside and look for a particle decaying inside, uh, inside your box and, and giving a signal there. So you don't necessarily need to focus uh, if you're sufficiently close. So th that's an th that's an interesting experiment one could do, um, and and as you say, also just real analyzing parks data could be interesting. And I don't quite have a good sense of how competitive it would be, uh, what the backgrounds are. So so this new star observation was a particularly quiet, uh, particularly quiet solar period. Um, uh, so so new star specifically. Uh, looked at the sun during this quiet time. And so, so the limit achieved is just on a very uh, small data set of um, uh, a few 1500 seconds, I believe, um, where just this, this one orbit. Um, uh, but, but you see here already in this, in, in this data, there's some spikes of events. And that's when the new star satellite was passing through the South Atlantic uh, anomaly. So charged particles can give you excess background. I, I don't quite have a good idea what the, the parks backgrounds are from charged particles, but I imagine they might be worse. Uh, David, did you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Hi. Um, I may have missed this, but for the bound axioms, what's the initial mm -hmm. uh, like orbital distribution that you assume? Uh, one can calculate. So, so Basically, um, there's a this this shape is universal for emission into a one over r gravitational potential, and the the reason is at um, yeah so so this is I, I derived this in my first paper so um, you can write you can write this differential spectrum just as as a integrals over all of phase space of all of the particles but including the axion so if you just extract this axion piece here and take the low momentum limit right you're interested in 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 just this sliver where it's very low velocity going out and so the integrand here completely is independent of k so basically at each point in the sun you emit into this uh, 3D ball, you emit, you emit uniformly into this ball uh, up to the escape velocity, uh, up to a momentum where you escape the solar system. Right. So from that, so you know the initial injection trajectories uh, and they give you an injection rate like this. Uh, so, and, and that gives you these very, very radial orbits. Um, and in terms of semi-major axis distribution, it gives you, um, one over a squared, where a is a semi-major axis uh, fractional distribution, but otherwise sort of maximally isotropic, uh, consistent with being emitted from maximally isotropic for, for each uh, for each point for each okay. emission point. So I guess then I'm curious, like in these long-term, like this plot you have here, this long-term mm -hmm. semi-major axis evolution, is your model just Newtonian gravity? Uh, yeah, the model is Newtonian gravity, but not one over R. So one of the complications we um, had to deal with um, was the fact that the, but the, you know, these are sun crossing orbits by by construction, right? You're emitted, you're emitted from the sun, so the orbits are not exactly Keplerian. Um, so this this piece here is in fact not exactly at t equals zero. I, 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 um, it's it's d close to zero, but but what can what does happen is extremely rapid perihelion precession because these particles are just going through the sun basically unperturbed, but the potential is not one over r there. So you get these uh, um, yeah rapidly precessing patterns. They kind of look like uh, Lisa Zhu patterns uh, very early on. Um, Wait, so so then you did I, I, the the reason I asked is because I know for Mercury, um, including GRFX has a significant effect on stabilizing its orbit? 
Mm -hmm. So um, I, I guess that's what you mean when you say you change the potential, like some GR effects, right? Or so, um, um, no, 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 what I mean, so, so well, the effect you describe is also there and we have considered it. We, we, so we didn't include GR effects in the long-term simulations because for most of the time they are small for the orbits that we care about, the ones that cross earth. Planetary perturbations are, are much larger um, but yeah, initially when you're on these, uh, you know, very low perihelion trajectories, the potential is not one over R. It has a one over R cube correction right. from, um, or maybe even one over R squared from, from GR. And also just the, it, the sun is not a point particle. That's why it's not one over R. Inside right. the sun. That's by far the dominant thing. And I should also say we, we uh, did analytic estimates before that not only this effect is negligible, uh, but we also did not include in our long-term simulations Mercury uh, or Mars or Neptune or Uranus because they'd be um, they give negligible contributions. So, do I have a slide here? Um, just want to show you here. Uh, um, this is um, a uh, sort of short time scale uh, analysis where we look at the chain, the fractional change in semi-major axis for a positive one, so sort of upscattering where you increase the energy and downscattering where you decrease the energy. And so we, we basically see that, that yeah, as a function of semi-major axis and the change is over a thousand years. So, so basically what happens is that uh, anything that crosses Jupiter's orbit, which is uh, this line here, so gets kicked out very quickly um, but for orbits in the inner solar system, Jupiter just uh, gives secular perturbations for the most part and, and changes the angular momentum of the orbits, especially uh, LX and LY. And uh, the, the planets, in particular Venus and Earth, are the dominant ones to give sort of chaotic uh, kicks, so random kicks, and, and they change LZ. And so, so yeah, so we, we think, and we're, we're doing some, some um, Markov process analysis now where basically uh, we think the final answer uh, you can get from, from taking these sort of short time scale scattering processes and making a Markov matrix out of this, <laughs> squaring it a bunch of times. And after a billion, after many iterations, you, you get the, uh, an evolution that's that's quite consistent. It doesn't capture, of course, everything like motional resonances, but but it captures sort of the the broad features of uh, of the evolution. So it's mostly close encounters from Venus and Earth, um, and uh, and yeah, secular perturbation from from Jupiter. And in fact, I I don't think I have it here. Uh, no, I don't. But but. You can calculate close encounters just from the gravitational scattering cross section, and the plot looks exactly the same uh, modulo these spikes, which a close encounter analysis cannot take into account for motional resonances. Yeah, we think we understand what uh, what happens. Oh, uh, thanks. Yeah, I, I I I think someone else has a question. I'd have more questions, but we uh, we need to stop there for now. Um, let's thank Ken altogether one more time. Thank you. Um, Ken, I know that you have a lecture to get to, but if you can stay for two more minutes on the call, we do have one more question. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I could stay. Uh, I could stay a while. I could stay.